Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the A-Pod, fun chats, fun topics, and fun people. I'm your host, Ardo Cal. You can check out this podcast every Wednesday at msgnetworks.com or subscribe on iTunes. This is, in fact, a bonus episode. Yes, you've heard me correctly. For the second week in a row, the A-Pod has decided to give you a bonus extra episode. And that's great. Look at us going above and beyond the call of duty. So this is our second bonus episode, and this one was a treat. Uh, You all know him as Mr. Devil. Anybody who is a hockey fan certainly knows Mr. Devil, especially if you're a fan of the New Jersey Devils. Uh, Current color commentator, but really heart and soul of the organization, dating back all the way to 1983. Three Stanley Cups, speaking of three, and really uh, one of the... Great defenseman to wear that New Jersey Devils uniform, so much so that his number rightfully hangs in the rafters at Prudential Center. I'm talking about Ken Danico, Dano as we call him. Uh, This was a terrific interview, and I'm really excited for you guys to hear this one because the first thing that I thought of when we wrapped was Dano needs to write a book. I really hope that he writes an autobiography or uh, some, uh, a ghostwriter gets involved or he writes it himself, whatever it is, I really hope that Dano releases a book on his life because he is an expert storyteller. And we get into a lot of great stuff. And actually, to be honest with you, I'll uh, pull the curtain on this interview a little bit. Uh, I wasn't going to get into any of the trials and tribulations of his life. And he brought it up early himself in the interview. And I thought that was not only uh, interesting, but also just shows you the type of character, type of man he is, you know, to say, listen, people go through ups and downs in their lives and they shouldn't be ashamed of that. And uh, people like him uh, come out better off for it. And so it was really interesting to talk to him about uh, his life. And we only scratched the surface. I said that in the interview as well, but we only scratched the surface on Dano's life. Uh, There was a lot that we couldn't get to just due to time restrictions. We recorded this before the last home game, and we all had a production meeting uh, before or at at 3 o'clock. So we had to wrap. But still, we got a lot of great stuff in this interview, and I guarantee you that we will have Dano back on the podcast because he's just he, has, he just has way too many stories. Uh, it, it was it was fantastic. We didn't even get to uh, uh, any early stories in the career, and uh, we do talk about uh, winning the Stanley Cup in two thousand three, though, uh, which was a really interesting conversation, and seeing his son sing the national anthem that was also uh, interesting to hear from his perspective as a proud papa doing color commentary and you know standing for the anthem as one usually does and this time it's his son singing which is what a cool moment that is so that interview is coming up in just a second i do want to mention that i the latest blog uh, that is up online at msgnetworks.com uh, hashtag arda's words on a blog is 10 random facts about the stanley cup the stanley cup trophy itself So this includes typos and misspellings on the cup, uh, food in the bowl, animals, obscure places in the world, a lot more. So if you've ever wondered if there's any spelling mistakes on the Stanley Cup or what the famous typos are, if you've ever wondered where in the world the Stanley Cup has been, how many babies have uh, been placed in the Stanley Cup, what about animals eating out of the Stanley Cup, what about Human beings eating out of the Stanley Cup. Has the Stanley Cup ever been filled with popcorn at the movies? Has the Kentucky Derby winner ever eaten out of the Stanley Cup? All of these answers are revealed in this blog. Ten random facts about the Stanley Cup. Were there years that the Stanley Cup was not awarded? Spoiler alert, yes. Uh, I will say this, the name that appears on the cup the most in Stanley Cup history... Uh, is John Beliveau. John Beliveau's name appears on the Stanley Cup 17 times. 10 as a player and 7 uh, from his time in the front office, all with the Montreal Canadiens. And we have more uh, facts like that as well 
in this blog. As I mentioned, the podcast usually drops on Wednesday, and this week's guest, in keeping with the Stanley Cup theme, was Phil Pritchard, who is known as the probably most forward-facing keeper of the cup. There is a team of keepers of the cup uh, that, that travel the cup around the world where it needs to go. And we have an interesting conversation about how the cup is scheduled, uh, who goes with the cup, what are the duties of the keeper of the cup, uh, where does the cup show up. Recently, it was at Grand Central Terminal, and it took the Metro North to uh, Stamford, Connecticut. I think it's with NBCSN right now uh, at their studios at Chelsea Piers in Stamford, Connecticut. And th- there were pictures online where uh, I think it was Catherine Tappan putting her niece in the bowl, or nephew, I think it was her nephew, uh, putting her nephew in the bowl of the Stanley Cup. (laughs) That was really cute. Baby was crying, unfortunately, but uh, Catherine, who's one of the hosts at NBCSN, said, uh, I'll be the coolest aunt for this picture in 20 years. That made me laugh when I saw that on social media. And so where else has the Stanley Cup been and and, and things like that? So we get into some really crazy stories. And also, uh, how do you become a keeper of the cup? A lot of people listening to the podcast will probably wonder, this sounds like an amazing job. How do I become a keeper of the cup? And Phil answers that question as well. And that's not his only job, by the way. He is a vice president with the Hockey Hall of Fame. So we get into what else he does with the hall because uh, he's got a very interesting position. Definitely check that out. That was Wednesday's episode, and this is a bonus episode, like we said. So without further ado, let's get to my interview with Ken Danico. Before we uh, switch gears, I just want to apologize. While we were recording, we tried to find the quietest place possible at Prudential Center, which ended up not being the quietest place possible at all. There was definitely a lot of noise happening. People were setting up behind us. Really, we were the inconvenience. So I'd like to apologize to everybody who was setting up uh, for the game because there were people practicing, doing dress rehearsals for, uh, for a musical performance out on the ice. And there were also people setting up food and coffee and, and whatnot. So really we were working around them. And we tried to find a quiet place, but it didn't end up being so quiet so if you hear a lot of hustle bustle in the background that's why so one more time to our listeners i apologize i'll try to do better with the location next time but let's get to it right now dano mr devil our conversation here on the apod with ken danico so here we are sitting at the prudential center and uh, we got a big get here this is a big get (laughs) mr devil himself has decided to come on the podcast uh, graciously giving us his time before the last home game of the season here. Uh, Ken Danico, thanks for thanks for coming on, man. My pleasure. I don't know how big of a get this is, but a pleasure <laughs> to be with you, Arda, and obviously a, a special night tonight with, uh, more importantly, the great Patrick Eliash, his last lap. So yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to uh, watching my, my old teammate, my old friend, and uh, giving him a big hug for everything he's done for this organization and his loyalty. So we all know the type of player he was on the ice, but what kind of teammate was he off the ice? Well, I will say over the years, he's certainly uh, grown, matured, as we always (laughs) say. (laughs) Uh, Always a good guy and couldn't speak very good English when he came to New Jersey in the mid-90s and played a couple of years in the minors. And he was a guy that lit it up down there, but it, it was the era of where you pay your dues before you come up. It was tough at the time even to crack the Devils organization because we were a team that was a perennial playoff team, a team that believed they could win the cup every year. Uh, so he probably could have cracked yeah. the lineup on another team earlier. But I'm certainly glad he had the patience, the Devils had the patience for everything he he's accomplished done. And he was, a, you know, Patrick's his, his own bird, <laughs> which, is, which yeah. is in a good way. I always remember, and we, him and I laugh about it, I think it was his first year, second year, uh, and I don't know exactly where it was. Might have been in Tampa Bay. I think Patty, Patty Allage, Peter Score, and myself all went. Three of us went out to dinner. And as everybody knew, there's no hidden secret. I was a little bit of a wild man back in my day and liked to have some fun, which was good. I was wild on the ice, wild off it. And, and I took those two guys out for a little fun. And I had the greatest time. They didn't know what they were in for with me, obviously. <laughs> I'm sure they were like, yeah, this will be I, I, fun. I'll be in bed by 11. Uh, I'll keep it uh, G-rated by the fact that I kept them out a little, a little bit late, I can say. <laughs> 
But I, I think it was something that opened their eyes, and they, they, they really had fun with it as well. And I was, and that's kind of how I got to know Patrick and Peter. And they had a little bit of broken English, and Patrick, you know, was, was learning his way. But we, could, I could tell right away the importance he was going to be the team, and I wanted to make sure I embraced them. We all have different personalities. We're different type of guys along the way as far as lifestyles and the way we live and everything. Yeah. But, uh, I just want to mention to everyone, uh, people are setting up around this. That's why you might hear some noises. <laughs> yeah. This is the quietest spot we could find at Prudential Center, and that's totally fine. We're impeding on them because they're getting their, their work done. But uh, fast, I, I want to forwarding, ask, though, fast forwarding yeah. with Patty and to, to now being so elegant, eloquent when he speaks yeah. and, and well thought out, and, he, and he's got a big heart and besides being a great player. <laughs> is he uh, I can imagine that night the next morning there's a practice he comes up to and he's like I can never do this again <laughs> well that's <laughs> happened with a few of my teammates yeah. over years. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific <laughs> oh I uh, like that's I said I, I gotta keep some things in the vault but yeah, yeah, I, I can tell you more stories with other guys and <laughs> I, I'm saving that whether it's for a book or a documentary <laughs> yeah but, <laughs> exactly but, but be, you know you'd, what you'd write a hell of a book yeah, but and there was a thought process along the way I had an outline everything else but kind of got put on hold because, you know, if, if I ever do it or did something like that, I'd want to tell all. And there's some stuff that, you know, even on my kids and everybody know my whole, because I, I, I wear my emotion on my sleeve. There was a lot of certainly ups. There was some downs. There was some craziness. So I kind of, I have to feel brave enough to tell it all. For me, it can't be just half-hearted you know what I mean do you envision a time where you could put pen to paper would you, would you write it yourself how, how would that process uh, go? you know what I, I like I said I had an outline with a pretty prominent uh, sports writer and then we kind of put it on the burner because they were worried about I don't want not to get into too detail I think okay. it would do great around here but they were worried about Canada because I haven't really spent much time in Canada and they've got all their Toronto Maple Leafs and Montreal Canadiens books and oversaturated. So maybe it was just the timing. But I want to make, if I did a book, it would be more, mine's not just about, like everybody has hockey books. Don't get me wrong, I'll do the three Stanley Cups and the fun and the craziness and my, my personality, but I would want it to be a life book because I've gone through some tough times. I've battled through a lot of those and some of them documented, but it was a little deeper than some people right. probably understand, which I would put in the book. You know what I mean? So... Who knows? Maybe. Um, well, you know. I'm I, hoping. I would love to read that book. I've I'm hoping so. <laughs> Putting that in the universe. If I, hey, I've come full circle and still here 33 years later with the Devils, which yeah. means everything to me. Even talking, going back to Patty, that meant a lot to me amongst all my you know, rambunctiousness, shall we say. And I know Lou, whoever was here at the time, even before Lou, they loved that rambunctiousness on the ice. They had to curtail uh, had to curtail me a little bit off sometimes but the ice part that's was me that was my personality gregarious full of personality and that's why i've been here 33 years and why I certainly was able to play fortunate enough to play for the devils as long as i did without uh, it's a miracle to me but without being traded or i had a lot of wrist slaps along the way for sure <laughs> but i'm so grateful for that because it's been family and you know to play in one organization is very special and i used to take to heart taking the young guys out and, and uh, you know yeah with me it was a little harder especially <laughs> for them to recover the next day but it was important to me to embrace. but you were probably the first guy there though yeah, yeah. i can imagine you oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. they're out till three four whatever and then you're up at oh, 7 a.m yeah, right in the gym you gotta make you, you, oh i <laughs> yes i could burn the candle at both ends but <laughs> that's i train like a mad so man. that's one your... thing but I, I like to do that with the young guys the rookies right. You want you want to embrace him, and I knew how important Pete Patrick was, and certainly Peter Score at the time. So, what's your life like today? G give me a typical day in the life of Ken Danico. Uh, it's pretty, you know, like people will say, full circle. It's probably relatively boring, uh, <laughs> which is a good thing for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you no, know, it's still fun. I mean, I mean, if I tell you this, you know, it stays between you and I because I was known as a tough guy and a pretty you know, intense person, and it's all about my dogs now. <laughs> How many dogs do you have? Do I have two dogs, and they're, they're my kids. What are their names? Puck and Stanley, of course. Puck, of course Puck it would be. Stanley, of course it would Stanley be. Cup. What kind of dogs so are they? I have a Westie and a, a Golden Doodle. One's three, one's four. They're four and a half now, Puck. Yeah, so I just, I can't wait to get home to see them. So that's, that's where my life has gone. And uh, certainly my wife, uh, Margaret, we've only been married for three years, so I, 
it's it's getting on them. Yes, I like my uh, people know, and if I'm going to be honest, I like my cigars. So I do go. I've got a group of businessmen buddies from truckers to lawyers to doctors that we I go to a cigar club in Summit, New Jersey, and we have That's our awesome. cigars and we play dominoes and because I'm still as competitive as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, those are the things I do, and I really look forward to it. We do it every Monday night. We watch sports. We engage it's a nice place so those things to me like i cherish those nights now for me because that's my my wife gives me a lot of leeway when i want it but i i like to go home to my dogs to her and 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 i have two great wonderful kids who one lives in new york going to school one's a senior in high school that you know i get to you know not to get too sappy or sincere but you know i understand now they need me even at 18 and 22 and you know, I've really been able to be there, be there, be there for him. I always was there for him. I never, I wasn't a guy that was too absent, but mentally I'm there for them. They can come to me for anything. And I love that. And I, I, I embrace it and take it on because, you know, your kids mean everything to you. I would think most parents would think that, but I'm glad that I'm be, a, I'm able to be there for them. So that's kind of the three little things, whether it's my dogs, my cigar shop, where it's my time. But going to see my daughter, going having lunch in the city, making sure she's doing good, and my son, who's sang the anthem here, I was going to ask about that. Got an yeah. aspiring acting, singing career. And, which take take me into that scene. So it's Rangers, <laughs> Devils, sold out, like really important game, and your son is singing the national anthem. So that must have been a proud papa moment. Well, I, I, absolutely. And I, my daughter and Shane, my daughter Taylor, both they sang the anthem together four years ago. So my t- daughter can sing really well too. She's in a f- doing at a school of fashion industry, but she still indulges in that kind of thing and still, you know, plugging away in New York with, with other things, but she enjoys the fashion too. And she giving in, dad fashion tips Getting an education. Yeah, oh, I, I cannot tell you how many times. She thinks <laughs> I'm a pretty cool dad for the most part. Really? Oh yeah, she she loves bringing her friends around, but when I wear something like she was, dad, that's, that's old. That's funny, Daddy. That's old. <laughs> so I love it. It's hilarious. And my son's big on that too, because he's he's the art guy. He's the passionate guy. He's the singer, the dancer, the actor, clothes. He knows a little bit of all that stuff. I love it because it's really broadened my horizons. Because my son, me, and uh, a fun time for my son and me is going to Broadway play. Going to oh really? Yeah. What was music, the last one you musical, saw? Musical um, with him, Motown. But I okay. I went to a Bronx Tale recently, which I loved. Oh wow. Um, but yeah, we've been to quite a few uh, Rock of Ages we loved. Went with my both my son and my daughter. So those are, my daughter loves hockey though. She comes to the games loyally. Like, my son comes to socialize. He knows all the security people obviously, because I've been here forever, so he's <laughs> known them since six years old. But it's not, a, not so much about the hockey for him, which I love, he's his own person. He, now my daughter, she takes the wins and losses hard. She texts me, what the hell's going on, dad, with the, with the devils when we lose? Now I've said all that, going back to that night with the Rangers when he sang the anthem on his own. I really wanted him to, and the Devils gave him that opportunity. They knew he could sing and everything, but great experience for him. You know, I wanted him to get that experience. He's got no problem singing in front of 17,000 people. He loves it. We did sound check at like five o'clock. He did, and I'm in the background, you know, being that doting parent concerned, and he had some glitches, like I heard. And I know nothing about singing, by the way, so I just support him. and. Everybody that tells me around me that knows more about it says, you know, he's got some ability, whether, whether it's acting, singing, he's got that presence. But, I, but I'm telling him, oh, Shane, is that how you're singing? It wasn't very good. He, I didn't say it wasn't very good. You never, I didn't want to make him nervous. I said, yeah. he goes, Dad, he says, it's not game time. Just like you when you played the game. I says, I'm finding my pitch. So is, I'm that, like, is that Shane behind was, us right now? No, there's <laughs> singing going on yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what's going on? He said, I'm finding my pitch. So I went, Oof, okay. And I thought he did a terrific job. I was thrilled. Thought he was fantastic. And better than I could have imagined. I just didn't want him to feel bad about his performance or not. You know, something went wrong, even though we all make mistakes. Yeah. But I thought it went, went really well and it was a great experience. A lot of people really uh, gave him a lot of praise and I was happy for him. Did your kids ever play hockey? Did you put them in hockey programs? Uh, my son played a little bit when he was, you know, not a whole lot. He just didn't. It, hockey's a sport you take to it. You, it's, a, it's not a niche sport. You love it or you don't. You're passionate about it or you're not. He wasn't. We, he played more baseball and soccer. Okay. Liked it a little bit more. Basketball, even. He's like all the, the sports. My daughter, now she's, she's more me. She's, even though she's got the fashion thing and the great voice, which I have a terrible voice. One tone, baritone. But... <laughs> Broadcast voice, I guess you'd say. Yeah, right. <laughs> but right. can't sing worth a lick. 
but she's intense like her dad. She's a sports fanatic. She played hockey for a couple years, and I'll tell you a great story with that. She's, I was a little old school. Okay. Um, as far as, do I really want my daughter playing hockey? And I'm being honest about it. Now I, I love women's hockey, kids hockey, little girls playing, because it's grown our sport tremendously, and they're great at it, and they love it. But I, back then, my daughter, I'm talking, when she started playing 14 years ago, when she was eight years old, she wanted to play, and I'm like, oh, I'm a little old school. Do I really want my daughter to play? It's a physical sport. You know, I'm thinking more along those lines. But signed her up, she played, she took figure skating already, so she was a good skater. Played two years. Now I'm getting into it. Now I'm near the end of my career. I'd go to every Sunday game because we didn't play all that much on Sundays. And she, and she um, was one of the better players. I retired in 2003. That was, she played her, I think, her third year. And like, she's good, I'm really liking it. And I'm wanting her to pursue it, you know, she's a great skater. Yeah. She goes, Dad, comes up to me in the summer, thought I'd be all hurt in August. I'm going, we're ready for, for the season, September, signing up and on the, what team you're gonna be on and all that stuff. She goes, I'm retiring. She, <laughs> she <laughs> this is an 11 year old girl oh, telling no. me she's retiring and I gave her a big, she did it strictly to see what her dad was doing and what, to feel, what he does. She liked it, don't get me wrong, and she was really gifted. She was good and could skate like the wind. And so that's why. Was she I'm, like her dad, stay at home defenseman yeah. or no? No, no she not at skate. all. She was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, she was playing defense, but she'd always be up the ice. I loved it. And I was really into it now. And, but when she retired, I said, because yeah, I always believe kids follow their dreams, their passion. But now I finally go, geez, I, I like her playing. And then she was good, so I like that. But, but she was like strictly, I knew it. I, I read. I just saw exactly what it was about. She was just seeing what her dad did. She liked it, but didn't have tremendous interest. Played sports growing all the rest, uh, growing as she was growing up. Yeah. But she just didn't want to play on a team any uh, on an ice hockey team anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. That's really cool uh, that they're pursuing their passions. It's really yeah, nice yeah, to hear yeah. that. You no, know, one I in fashion, I, the other in singing. That's great. You know, and I, I don't take for granted a lot of parents. I see the in the sports, live vicariously through the kids, or push them, or even former teammates of mine or athletes that really jam it down their kid's throat. And I'm not saying everybody has their own way and God bless them, yeah. you know. But that was so, I was so opposite. I always feel if you push somebody, you can guide them. I can give them a little poke, even with my son. I, that's what I tell him. But he didn't didn't like it. I was like, no problem. Right. Man, you, you, Whatever you like, I, I'll support that. And I love it because he's brought in my horizons. He's taught me some things about the arts <laughs> yeah, and, and, and more the, the the singing. And I loved watching them grow up doing plays and doing plays since seven years old, whether it was school plays, community plays, different things he's done along the way. He was on a kid's bop when he was 12 years old, got uh, got a paid gig. So that was, his, we've got his first check framed. He got paid wow. for, I, I'm sure you've heard of the kid's bop. He did kid's bop 22. He was on, on it, went for an audition and got it. <laughs> this is back when he was 12. So we're hoping, now he's 18. He's got a ways to go, but now it's now he wants to go for the big time. But that was pretty cool at 12 years old for him. I was proud of him. Right. You know? it, it was pretty neat. He did a recording in the city, and so he, he, that's what he's pursuing. He loves it. I support him. But now I tell him the only thing I can give you, Shane, is work ethic, heart. That's what I had here. I didn't have the most talent. I was, yeah, I was a key part of the team in in my my area, what I do, and that was the intensity. That was physicality. That was you know, bringing passion, heart, and I hated to lose. And you need more guys like that uh, uh, that hate to lose. And if you don't have enough of them, you're not going to win a Stanley Cup. But I'm a believer in that because every team's got good players. Right. I knew my role, understood it, but I said, Shane, that's what I, we're entertainers. I was an entertainer, but mine's about winning. Yours is about uh, a lot of kids or a lot of people want to do what you want to do. And yes, you've got some talent, but there's so many people with talent. But you got to have the passion to want it more. That's the only thing I can lend him on his path and his journey and support him. I want to ask some uh, career questions. Some things that actually I'm really curious about. I thought of you uh, at trade deadline this year because obviously you spent your entire career with one team. And I, I actually wondered whether or not you ever got close to, to being traded in your career. Did that ever come up? I, I don't think you hear as much about it as the rumors. You hear a couple of rumors, and I'll tell you one, but I think it probably more closer to it than I might even imagine. I really, I probably could get it out of Lou because I was with him a long time. Yeah. And, 
I don't know how truthful he'd be to me, but I think he might. I, I really haven't asked him. You know, I, I, did you ever, was there a point where you were going to trade me? Was it close? Uh, and I assume yes is the answer at times, and I'm very fortunate grateful I wasn't. It was, uh, so it never came family. to you? Like there was well, never I, a... I, in the papers, it was in 1989-90, one of those years, and it was just rumors, you know, how they start throwing out. I did, was unaware of it. Lou never came to me, but the paper... So this was the media? Blew, the media, it was right the media. away, okay. Ken Danico was close, close to being traded to the Calgary Flames. So what did you think when you read that? Like you hadn't heard this from the team at all. You just no, the first right time you're hearing of it is right in, the in the newspaper. Paper, yeah, and, it, and that's so weird. It, that, that's how you would discover yeah, and something it was like that. Saying close, so <laughs> now they might have gotten it from the Flames because I know Calgary was interested in me. Okay, uh, Lou may have may have been engaging it, or Lou may have said, "No way, we're not trading them." I have no idea. So you know how it might have come from one side, not the other. And Lou hated. He kept things close to the vest, as you know. But I read it right in the paper. I was, uh, how was I? I was shaken up. I, if we forget, we're all, we're all sensitive. We're all, uh, especially back then, I would handle it a lot better now because I know a lot more <laughs> yeah. in my retirement, my old age. But uh, you understand a lot of things better. And I know it was a business, blah, blah, blah. As we always use those term, that terminology. But I was you know, still relatively young. I wanted to be here. And I it, said it many times. And it meant something to me. I was loyal to this team. They've been loyal to me. I wanted to be part of the solution, part of turning it around. We were finally getting better. We'd finally made the playoffs in 88, and it was about a year and a half later in that range that I hear I might be traded. So, yeah, I wasn't happy about it. <laughs> why, why, why New Jersey? Like, why the Devils? Was it just because it was their first team and you fell in love with it? Like, why, why did you decide yeah. that you would stay here for your entire career? If well, they had you, which they did. Yeah, like I said, I, I got lucky, fortunate too, because, yeah, it doesn't happen too often. Especially Wayne Gretzky been traded. Anybody can be, obviously. Usually star guys, maybe you see it happen to more often. I knew what I was, my, my role, and I was fortunate that they thought enough of me to think I was always a piece of the puzzle. And that's all I, I was realistic. I knew what I was and what I brought to the team. But I'm proud of the element I brought because you need, you don't win with five Ray, you can't win, just win Stanley Cups or Champions with five Ray Borks and five Wayne Gretzky. It certainly helps <laughs> yeah. that you need the role players. You need the support pieces of guys that bring that, whatever they bring. Yeah. And I know what I brought. Uh, I didn't know where New Jersey was when I was drafted here. I, it was 1982, I got the call in June. I've said it many times, Arda. It's been documented, I've done it in speeches, but since we're on your podcast, I'll say quickly. I get, you know, every, there's a draft every summer, as we know, every league. 1982, June, I, I was cautiously optimistic on being drafted, not ranked in the first round whatsoever. There was only 21 teams at the time. Where are you playing, son? WHL? I played WHL, I was out in Seattle. Okay. So I'd played in Spokane, we folded, when ended up going to Seattle. Seattle Breakers at the time, now they're still in the league, but as the Thunderbirds. Okay. So it's June, the end of June, wherever the draft was. The draft was in Montreal. No cell phones, obviously. I don't get flown to the draft. You know, agents only did that for first rounders. I wasn't ranked to go in first rounders back then. Now everybody goes and they fly everybody because it's such a bigger business. But so where were you? You got to save the bucks. I was in Edmonton, Alberta, where I grew okay. up. That's where I grew up. My mom. Were you was born there as well? Born in Windsor, Ontario, but I always say Edmonton because that's really my where I grew up. Okay. So Edmonton's my really my home. W when did you move? How old were you when you moved? Seven years old. Seven six years and old. Half, seven. Okay. I just turned cool. seven. So Edmonton. Who did you support when you grew up? Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. You were a Leafs fan. Yeah, because the Oilers weren't here yet. When I got oh, fair the enough. Oilers, the WHA days, when the World Hockey Association came in, I was a huge Oiler fan. Okay. And then even a little bit, you know, when they became the Oilers, but that's when I was being drafted. They came in 79, I liked them, and I was very friendly as a, well, if you want to get into it, Mark Messier became a dear friend of mine and helped me my career and how, what it was going to take to be a pro and, and, and all those very things. Very cool. So I was around all those Stanley Cup teams. When I was 18, 19, I'd already been drafted. So going back to my draft, day, 18 years old, I think I'm gonna go third round maybe, you know? That's the grumblings, but I, I, I'm i cautiously optimistic, but nervous. My mom gets me out of bed like, eight, the draft starts at 10 in Montreal. It's eight in, in Edmonton, time change. Uh, she calls me, I'm groggy. I went out with my brother for a couple of pops, nervous, you know, the night before. 
So I'm tired a little bit and I go, my mom goes, take this call, Kenny. It's like 8.40. And they did the draft a little quicker than nowadays. But yeah. she, she was just come down, take this. I go, mom, it's one of my friends playing a prank. It's too early. I looked at the clock, you know. <laughs> she goes, oh, son, I think you should take this call. And my mom's passed away since a little petite lady of five foot one. And mm-hmm. I had told her every day since seven years old, 50 times a day. And she had been on TV and told people this, that I was going to play in the National Hockey League. And she used to pacify me, say, yeah, yeah, Kenny, I know. But she thought I was dreaming maybe a little big, but wouldn't deter me. So I pick up the phone. I go down there. I go, hello. And they go, congratulations, Ken. You've just been drafted 18th. In the first oh, round? In the first round, 18th overall. And uh, this is Marshall Johnson. And I dropped the phone, didn't listen to nothing, another word. I'm, I'm tears in my eyes because everybody knows I'm an emotional guy. My mom, mom, what, what? My dad, like my brothers, sisters, everybody. I, I go, you know, I was choked up. I get choked up about saying, thinking about it now. I was like, I just, I'm like, oh, excuse me. Don't I can't bleep it, bleep don't worry. Out. I just went, <laughs> yeah, bleep. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I just, and that, that's what came out of my mouth in front of my mother, which I never would swear in front of. <laughs> I just went 18, bleeping 18th overall. They were like, no way. <laughs> like we were all no way <laughs> so i don't know who watched me who saw me my mom goes well ask who it is i go i didn't ask what team it was didn't even know i pick up the phone oh yeah who is this it's marshall johnson from new jersey i turned to my mother covered the phone said where's new jersey i had no idea where new jersey was <laughs> they didn't have a team name we didn't have a team name yet it was still voting for it because it was the original year they moved from colorado yeah. where the rockies and the great john mcmullen moved them here and they, so you eight, get drafted to this unnamed New Jersey unnamed NHL New Jersey franchise. Team and I didn't know where it was. I knew it was near this big <laughs> city in New York. I had no idea. But I would have ran the 3,000 miles to get my opportunity. I was happy. Everybody, Edmonton Oilers picked 21st. And oh, wow. They, I'd heard I wasn't, they weren't taking me because I wasn't ranked there. But everybody thought, oh, you want to go to your home team? I'm going, are you kidding me? They're stacked. I don't want to go to a team that uh, it going to take me a lot longer to have an opportunity. New Jersey wasn't a very good team. I thought I'd get a better, good opportunity because New Jersey, they were coming from Crack Colorado spot, and yeah. they were in disarray. And so I was elated. It didn't matter where it was. I was elated, came to Jersey. And that was my heart and soul of wanting to play in the National Hockey League. This was the team going to give me my chance. Long story short, great training camp as an 18 year old. Even kept me a couple of weeks, didn't play me in a regular season game. But like most at eight to the overall picks, back to juniors for one more year, had a real good year. Played my first game October 5th in Madison Square Garden. The wow. Sports. Uh, what a place the, to have your first game. Sports arena in the world, as they say, or the hockey. Uh, what, the, what were you like that? Take me into the locker room that before that first game. What were your, what were your was, nerves like? I, I, was, I was a rocker. I was intense. I was boisterous. Even at 19, not quite as I, <laughs> like I was maybe five years into my career. I respected the veterans, but I was just an intense guy. So I was... I couldn't feel my feet. I remember going out warm up. I tightened my skates way too tight because I was just so fired up. And I had to go back and dress them. My feet were numb. So after warm up, I loosened them up a little because you want to get everything perfect. Your first game, my sticks, I kept shaving my sticks a little lower, did the different lie and making sure it was the right height. And skates were too loose, too tight. I re- tightened them up about five, six times. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get it right. You know, yeah. I'm just trying to be perfect. And then I said, stop it. Go out and play, man. You, 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 you. Done it your whole life. This is your dream. Don't don't get all these outside thoughts and, and things to distract you. Go play. Get get out there and play. And had a blast. We lost, I think, 7-3. Picked up my first point, first game. Uh, you know, played physical, and I was like, my mom flew out. She does, didn't really want much to do with big city. She's a small town girl. Was a small town girl. My right. mom and dad came out. My brother, sisters sitting in the garden and then New York was a whole nother world to them, a whole nother animal, as it was to me, because I was only a 19 year old kid, but been here already from training camp. And she goes, I don't care if he plays another game. He told me every damn day he was going to play in the National Hockey League. Worked out well. I went on to play 1,283 more and I don't think she anticipated that. (laughs) So take me back. So the early years, right? It must have been uh, a double stab then when Wayne Gretzky said those comments about New Jersey, right? Like the Mickey Mouse organization. Like yeah, and a was... guy from Edmonton where you grew up, he's a legend there, the dynasty team, and then he's calling your team a Mickey Mouse. Yeah, like, what did you, you feel like? You know what? I was really a kid then. I was 19. I didn't play that game. I broke my leg. So I was actually in the stands when, 
when the, the outcome might have been different then. Uh, yeah, yeah we <laughs> might have lost thir- uh, 12 4 or <laughs> whatever it was no ha- having said that I didn't make a huge deal of it. we weren't very good we, we knew it but uh, it was more of a uh, in a ble- it was more of a blessing in disguise because I think from some of the young players standpoints then Johnny Mack came in 83 was drafted even though he played a little bit then went back to junior Kirk Muller after Brennan Shannon, the Craig Willannons, all us young, Joe Sorella was already there. Pat Verbeek, all had went on to have great careers. We took it to heart, you know, we were going, yeah, we might be, because we are, it was realistic. And we had the veterans, it must have been harder on the Dave Lewis and Mel Bridgman's. They'd had great careers already, Phil Russell's, but, you know, they knew where they, they were at and it was about them tutelaging us young guys and us young guys believed we were gonna be something someday, you know? We all had wanted to, stay on this team, wanted to prove that we're going to be, you know, we'll show you, we'll yeah. be contenders one day. And that's when we didn't, first five, six years with a group of us young guys, we were all like, the Brat Pack was me, Johnny Mack, Kirk Muller, uh, Pat Verbeek and Joe Sorrell, the five of us always hung together on and off the ice. And we were tight knit. That's why we, when, eight, when 1988 rolled around and we went 7-0-1 just to get in the playoffs our last eight and had to win in overtime and Johnny Max for a goal. That was our coming out party. That was our turning point saying, see, we told you, we're going to stick together. We believe in this team. and We're going to be part of the solution. Now, we went on to win. We took seven more years to win the cup. A lot of different faces because you got to trade great players to get good players. So the Mullers and Shanahan's were gone. And that's when the Stevens came in and the Broders and the Richets because he was traded for Kirk at the time. So those guys were a huge part of it. It was all, and they went on to have their great careers, but they were assets at the time and Lou molded the team. But that 88 team was so special because we knew that was kind of our group that Bruce Driver as well, you know, yeah. we're our group that. We, we show, we'll show you, we're going to be something. And we became something and that was important to us. And it was here in New Jersey. And that's, to me, New Jersey was everything. I, the Devils were my team. They gave me a chance to play. I just, I couldn't have thought of playing anywhere else. I, you know, I, today there's a lot of business agents, things going on in the background. That's why my agent didn't fly me to the draft because he didn't think I was going in the first round. I fired him the next year. I swear <laughs> to God. Although we laughed about it and I was on, it was Bill Waters. I was on, he's doing later, radio. Bill. Him and I, I was on with him a couple of years ago. I says, Bill, you know I got ready, right, at the time? He goes, oh, I know. He says, because you didn't think I was going in the first round. He goes, no, I didn't. And I said, either did I, Bill. We laughed about it. <laughs> but I still but, fired but you. True story, yeah, true story, true story. Because I said, you didn't show any faith in me. So, yeah, I, how dare you? I didn't believe I was going there either. <laughs> there's a lot, I mean, uh, there's a lot online about your playing years. I don't want to talk too much about your playing years, but I do want to hear about uh, 2003. Because, like you said, you've had your ups and downs, professional and personal life, but now here you are, okay, your very last game in the NHL, you're holding the Stanley Cup. I mean, that's a very rare occurrence. There's only a couple of people that have really had that sort of storybook ending. So take me into that moment uh, where it all comes to a head and it ends on a high like that. Well, I'll start with, first off, I'm a pretty lucky guy, and I appreciate a lot more, even as the years go along. You know, I, I didn't absorb it as much. I did with the fans and knew it was going to be my last game and the whole nine yards and, yes, the winning and going out on top. I mean, I couldn't have dreamed of that. It was a dream scenario. It was a dream ending for me. But I really appreciate it now. 12, 13 years uh, removed from my playing days, I, I go, man, I am just the luckiest guy in the world, you know, uh, for, you know, a blue-collar guy. That's why the fans adopted me here and why I love the fans. It's a, I consider it a blue collar state. They, that's the player I was, mm-hmm. heart and soul guy, guy that would stick up for the colors. Fans appreciated that, and that's why I have, I feel, I'm blessed to have such a great rapport, like any superstar would, and I do, and I'm grateful for that, and I, I own that because I, I say that in a humble way because I, I love that because they could relate to me, mm-hmm. and I hung out with them even as a player. You know, that was me. I was out there with the people, but so. To, that series. When did you know that that was going to be your last year? Well, I'll tell you, it was, I knew my role had diminished a little bit. And I played 69 games that year, sat out some. I hadn't missed a playoff game in my history of the Devils. Devils, And that was 100 and, I want to say 60-something straight, 162 straight. I don't know the exact number. And then Pat Burns comes to me, which everybody knows, the late Pat Burns. And 
God rest his soul, because I'm grateful to him now. We didn't see eye to eye always, but it was, you know, because I was a competitor in tents, but I understood, and Lou had taken me aside, that I may not play every game in the playoffs. Played the first 12, and so that may, you know, things going good, played game, you know, played the first 12, and we were, we were beating the Boston Bruins three games to nothing. They're sitting me out game four. Now I'm a little angry because we just came off a shutout. So I'm going to break my streak like this. Not that it was, you know, but I hadn't missed the playoff game. So, yeah, you take some pride in that. Pat took me aside. I didn't like the way he handled it. So it, was, it got ugly. <laughs> and they knew that was me. It got ugly. But then I took a step back. I just wanted to win. Wanted to be part of it. Lou helped me with that, you know, my emotional side of it. And I said, you know, we've got to get everybody in. And I'm part of it. I played the first 12. I don't. So then we lose. Then I go back in game five and we win. And it wasn't because me, but I, it was karma. <laughs> take some credit. You can take some credit. Sure. So game, game, we this is your podcast. <laughs> no, we, it was karma. And the writers let Pat know about it. <laughs> and he didn't like that because he was an intense guy. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, fast forwarding. And I missed. Now I'm in and out. Now it's okay. I've already missed my game, even though it was a battle at the time. Me and Pat went out a little bit. And then. I played game six and seven against Ottawa, who I thought was the best team in the league. They were awesome. They, they just had such a deep team. and We had them down 3-1. They came back 3-3, game seven in Ottawa. And I played Who's on that team? It was like Alfredson, was it Chara, Lehman, that Chara? Alfredson, a young host. Uh, oh, yeah. They, yeah, yeah. They, they, were, they were stacked. Okay. So uh, I play that game. We win game seven. Jeff Friesen scores a huge goal late. Going to the Stanley Cup Finals against the Ducks. So I, I'm in six and seven against Ottawa, who I thought was missing. And all of a sudden, I get told, game one, you're not playing. Into the Stanley Cup Finals. Oh, I'm devastated, you know. But now it's the point where I go, I just want to win. It's just, I'm part of it. I'll get in the series. Don't worry. But I couldn't understand it. I didn't, you know what I mean? I, why? I, I just played six. I'm good enough to play against Ottawa, the best team in the league, in six and seven, these kinds of finals, but I can't go in now. And I knew. I was 39 years old, four years old. I was... Now that I look at it, I'm grateful at how the heck I even played that long, you know, but so if I look at it realistically, but you're emotional at the time, so I don't play them. We win the first two games at home easily against the Ducks. So I'm going to tease. I'm not going to, definitely not going to get in now, Yeah. but that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm accepting because I just want to win. I want I, the guys that have never won a cup to be part of, you know, the Jim McKenzie's and, and certain players, or, or was it Jim? Or Jim might have been 2000. I might mix names with the Friesens, the that the guys that hadn't won cups just to make sure we the, the first timers get that opportunity right. and have the part of it. So whatever it takes, and I hope Pat's pushing the right buttons. And if that means I'm out, I'm out. Win the first two. So I obviously not gonna be in. We lose the next two in Anaheim. So now it's two two. Now the ducks fight back. Game five, I think I got a shot to get in. I'm going, now I'm all excited. I'm working hard on the with the black aces off the ice, you know. <clears throat> And I was one of the leaders of that and keeping them positive. I was not sulking because I was about team and I wanted to win. So if my moment came, I have to be ready. Whatever the little part that was. So I'm not, he tells me I'm not in game five now. I'm like, oh God, now I'm not going to play this down the finals. It's fine. Let's just win. Angry, upset, the whole nine yards, in all realm of emotion. But I just want to win. So I never rock the boat in the papers. Now this is about the team, you know. We win game five, we're up three two, go to Anaheim game six, we're not in obviously. And I just want to win the cup and I think we're gonna win in game six. Well we lose. So now we come back for game seven. Now I'm I'm, I'm still resigned. I'm not playing. I haven't played in two weeks. Fly back, it's a Wednesday game and and I'm I believe Friday at home, so both teams have to travel, a lot of jet lag. We land, we're staying in a hotel, we don't get in until about seven o'clock, bus to the hotel. Yeah. Team dinner, game next night. Pat Burns, 8 o'clock. This is Kenny, I want to see you. Out, walks me outside the hotel and goes, you're in tomorrow night, and walks away. Doesn't say, Boo. That's it. That's it. That's it. Walked away. Don't th- he says, you're in tomorrow night, and don't tell anybody. Don't tell the press. Well, he wants it to be. That's it. Walked away from me. Like, no. <laughs> wow. So I'm like going, now I'm in between uh, uh, almost tears and excitement. And going, calling my, called my best friend, and said, "You're not going to believe this." He goes, and right away with a, on cue, he says, "You're in tomorrow night." He says, "I knew you'd be in." I go, "You're glad you did," because I said, "Not in a million years did I think I'm in." And then I go to my friend, I go, "And by the way, I think it's the wrong decision." Now I'm thinking it's the wrong decision, so I start talking to a few family members. I'm like, 
this guy's nuts. Why is he putting me in game seven? I haven't played in two weeks. Everything's on the line. I'm like beside myself going, now finally, he should have put me in five, should have put me in game one. Why is he putting me in game seven? I don't want to, now I'm thinking like a rookie going, I don't want to be that guy that costs us. I know I'm going to play my 12, 13 minutes, whatever it is, but what does my cost? Stanley Cup, I'll never live with myself. And then they all brought me to reality. Ken, you played 100, it was 174 playoff games at the time, 1,283 in the league. I think you can handle this situation. You know, they had to calm me down. I think you knew what you were doing. <laughs> yeah. I go and I go, okay, fine. Well, I look back now, all karma. We win game seven. Pat, I gave Pat Burns, was a cigar guy too. I gave him a cigar at the end. I said, Pat, I know we didn't see eye to eye always. Again, I was very emotional with it and said, but, you know, I'm we're very grateful. Thank you very much. You, you just, it's over. And that's when I, you asked me, let's go back to that. Was it over? I knew going into game seven, that was it. I'm like, you knew win or lose, that was going to be your last game. Win or lose, wow. that, that was going to be it. You know, meaning I was praying for a win, and I might have had different feelings if I lost. Okay. The second we won, it was like, it's over. I'm, you can't go out. This is the best. I thought I was going to play one more year originally. Right. Try to. And, and I even got a call from another team that said, you, for, to be a 60. Really? Yeah, yeah. I won't Which team was team. Oh, you won't tell I can't tell. I don't want to say it because it was a, Lou knew about it. It was fun. But Lou says, what are you thinking? And I... He, I know what he wanted me to do, retire, because they wanted to move on. I knew it with younger guys, and I said, it's over, Lou. I said, how can I top this? <laughs> but, um, so, and I wasn't going to play anywhere else. You're kidding me at this stage of the game. You were Mr. Devil at that point, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Mr. Know. Devil wearing the Leafs jersey or whatever it is. It was, it, was a, it was a courtesy call. They actually, it was more of a courtesy call, because they kind of said, Jim said, we're assuming but, you know, you'd be a good leader, and, and I'd, I'd come full circle in my life and at the time. And so they said, if you're interested, we might be interested. And I said, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered, but no, thank you. you nice to that. get the call. And, and they were laughing. They're going, we thought that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, so I played 20 years. You think I'm going anywhere else? But so Pat, I didn't see eye to eye, but I gave him a cigar after gave him a big hug. He said, man, you know, you just... Thank you so much. Greatly. I go, why the heck did you put me in game seven? Are you nuts? He goes, well, he says, I felt that we needed a spark with the fans, the crowd, the sixth man. My, our great devil says that I've talked about earlier in the, the podcast here about how the relationship I had with him. He says, I knew they'd be fired up to see you in the lineup. I thought that would energize. He says, all those little pieces add up. And so it's about the coaches pushing the right button. And it made sense. The fans went crazy. When they announced I wasn't scratched and then went crazy on my first shift, he put me out there on the last shift. Uh, and that's when I knew I'm going, it's over. We we're up three nothing. The game was pretty sealed. I dropped my stick. I was very, I, I, the last shift was like a minute. And I looked like I was a kid that didn't even know how to skate. <laughs> I dropped my stick. I was kind of swimming around the net, throwing bucket. It wasn't, I was just so, it, everything was going through my mind. No, my career's over, going out on top. and. So special, and Pat put me in in Game Seven, which I was so grateful for. Just storybook ending. It was perfect. You know, I know he had talked to Scott Stevens, the captain at the time, before he put me in too, and said, "What do you think, Scott? Is this a good call here?" And Scott was said he was all for it. He says, "Yeah, he says, the fans. He's going to sure. bring emotion. <laughs> sure. Don't worry. He'll he's played enough games. He'll handle that part too. Playing the game. Wow. <laughs> but it was about giving the team a boost, and Pat." Because uh, I had asked him. I was serious. And I had no idea why he was putting me in. I said, Pat, I was very angry at you. You know it. I yelled that we had had our battles. But I said, now I didn't think it was the right decision. And wow. He laughed. We laughed about it and said, well, that's Kenny. I it worked to get out well. It worked out well. <laughs> and the rest there's is history, a, and it was a great ending. There's so many stories to talk about with you. But the la what I want to end on in this podcast is uh, your, your life post-hockey. So after 2003, uh, obviously, you're a broadcaster now. You're yeah. a color analyst, but just take me through that path from when you stopped playing hockey to you're now a color analyst with the Devils. Yeah, well, you know, I I'd hoped or felt I would stay in the organization in some capacity. You know, having been here so long, and certainly Lou took me aside and said, "What do you want to do?" And did that happen over the summer? Like, did you? Yeah, it was yeah. right away. I mean, he, he said, "Look, what do you want to do?" I, and I'd already done a little nurturing for broadcasting, meaning I was. WFN had given me some opportunities. I'd okay. go on air. I did a couple shows even with Ed Coleman. I was a sports junkie, so sometimes it wasn't even hockey, which I loved. And then I started doing a little bit with Sports Channel, which eventually became MSG. It was dabbling um, and doing a lot of community stuff for the Devils and a lot of corporate functions when they'd ask me to go. You know what I mean? So 
they were taking care of me, but still working with the team. But I started dabbling into the broadcast and then officially 2006, only three years after where I really came full time to broadcast me, but I was doing the, 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 the four games in between periods. Uh, and the post game, like Johnny Mac. Kind of did thing. you ever have a desire? Like, did you ever envision yourself uh, after your playing days to be a broadcaster? Was that something well, in the back I, of your mind? I, I'd been uh, a lot of the writers who I had a good rapport with, and ups and downs too, but a good rapport for the most part. And they were very kind and fair to me. And a lot of them said, you know, you're win, lose, draw. You're always out there, you know, answering questions for us. You speak well. You, you, you're well thought out and said I'm not the most I told him I'm not the most articulate but I'm passionate he says that would make a good broadcaster have you ever thought about going some of them were telling me about broadcasting I said no I haven't really thought about it but that kind of opened my <laughs> eyes a little and I right. listened <laughs> it got the wheels churning right you know to say well maybe maybe that'd be something good for me I I enjoyed talking uh, hockey enjoyed I was like I said gregarious on and off the ice so probably a good spot for me and that's when I did it and we did had a good run with a hockey night live show for eight nine years, which I really enjoyed and got my feet wet. But really the turning point in your broadcast career was your appearance on the MSG Hockey Show. There, right? it, it's yeah, exactly. live that's at Prudential. That's it all started. But it, just, it really, what? the pivotal point <laughs> is to skyrocket. It. It was, I love it. Well, that's more, <laughs> I like to be fun, like kind of the podcast where yeah. we're able to elaborate a little bit more. I, I want to eventually be, maybe do one of these hockey things with a bunch of old tough guys or old players or teammates and opposite guys I played against oh, wow. and we had battles with where we could have no holds be? bar kind of our show conversation that would be fun because then we can really get a little serious it doesn't matter what comes out of our mouth but but that's would be the best stuff to me you know what i mean so that's but yes i did like the show and then i when chico left you know the opportunity was the color guy and i it was a big transition because you're on live and you got to be you know heavily involved there's more preparation than i thought i think i've gotten better over the last couple of years i've really <laughs> You know, my preparations this year especially really went to another level because I really, even though I know the game, I know players, I watch, even when I was a player, a lot of guys got away from, you know, I watch more hockey than anybody. I was a nut, you know, I had a fanatic watching everything. But I learned from our producers, from Roland, from guys that what it takes to really, it takes work, you know. And But then I now I'm talking hockey, something I love, and my team, which I love. So, yeah. so that transition was has been good, I've enjoyed it, and I still do a lot of other things for the Devils organization, which I love. I'm kind of, I want to say, don't want to say jack of all trades, Master None. I want to say I'm, you know, they use me a lot, and I like that, you know, whether it's at a corporate meeting to speak, whether it's with the fans, whether it's with, in the community. So I do a lot of different things. Oh, you things. go into boardrooms sometimes? People, yeah, they'll bring you into okay. like CEOs or around the table? They, they, yeah, and they, they just, I, well, know, I imagine I'm, they I'm love not, that. I, I, I want to say I'm there just for my good looks. <laughs> but I don't You're there for the stories, Dan. But, no, but it's just like some of the stories we tell you, I share with them. They like it. And hopefully it engages like all the business side of the devils and the people that know a lot more than me from that aspect. They, I, help, I try to help close the deal sometimes. <laughs> and, and by being me. That's right. <laughs> you know, and if it does help minuscule at times... It's great because the Devils are, are in my heart. They're, as Tom McVie, one of my old-time coaches who I loved, who I started with yeah. Devils, also was in the minors after I broke my leg for a little bit. And he was my coach there, coached me in my first 12 games before I broke my leg as a 19-year-old, and then came to my retirement in He's late 80 or no, late 70s now, Tommy, still scouting for the Bruins, and every time I see him, but he came, 2006 when my number was retired, he... He told the star ledger, he says, he says hey, kind of, I like, I was wondering, should my number really be retired? You know, I know the long, all the years, but I'm not a star. Like, I was realistic. And Tommy goes, heck, he's got to, you got to retire his number. He's got this deep, grovelly voice. He says, he's got a devil tattooed to his heart, like the devil logo. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It was funny at the time, but it meant a whole lot to me because he, he, he was damn right. And I still feel that way today. And it's... That's the way I am. We, I'm loyal. They, they've been good to me. My devils are my everything. They're my second family. So, and when Tommy said that, an old time coach says, "I've never seen a guy." When he said the devil tat, logo was tattooed hard, he says, "I've never seen a guy care more for an organization." And I don't say that to out of brashness. I say that out of I appreciated that, and he was damn right. And I, I think that's that says a lot, and I'm proud of that. 
<laughs> Dano, we uh, definitely need to have a part two sometime. Uh, <laughs> right, we man. definitely do. We didn't even get to Battle of the Blades. Oh, forgot. Well, I, I figure skated. And, <laughs> oh, we could go on and on. That'll I, I be got, for the this, second part. That'll be a we teaser. We might be able to do five podcasts, and that'll be all part of my book. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting it all out. Describe <laughs> it, and then boom, into the book. <laughs> Dano, thanks for your time, man. My pleasure. Enjoy it. So there it is, our conversation with Mr. Devil Ken Danico, and I bet you want to read his book now. I know I do. If I was a ghostwriter, if I had any writing ability, I would sign up to write his book yesterday because I think that would be a number one bestseller. Just the way that he tells stories and the stories he has to tell, oh boy, that would be one heck of a book to read and probably one of the better athlete biographies that has been released. So I hope somebody gets on this. If you're a writer, if anybody's a writer, please just tweet Dan. I'll just say, hey, I'm a ghost writer or I'm a writer. I'll gladly get involved with your autobiography or your biography. I, I, I just want this to happen. I really do. I, I really want this to happen for Dano because it's, yeah, I think it would be a credit to the sports world to have his story, his full story out there. So we will get him on the podcast again. There will be a part two sometime down the line. Uh, Just a couple of reminders, 10 random facts about the Stanley Cup. That is my latest Arter's Words on the blog. You can find that at msgnetworks.com. Wednesday's guest, uh, this podcast usually drops on Wednesday. It was Phil Pritchard, who is a vice president with the Hockey Hall of Fame and the most famous keeper of the cup. He has a lot of stories regarding the Stanley Cup trophy and its travels. You can listen to that podcast on iTunes or msgnetworks.com. And yeah, catch us again on Wednesday. We'll have another guest here on the A-Pod. And be sure to enjoy the playoffs. Enjoy the playoffs. It's Stanley Cup playoffs, everyone. And that's the best. Because in my humble opinion... Hockey playoffs, the NHL playoffs are the best kind of sports.